Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We have another session of uh, Expert Analytical Club. We'll have a session for two hours. During the first hour, we have speakers answering the questions. In the second hour, we'll have a Q&A discussion involving all the participants. Our today's uh, speakers include Arkady Dubnov, political scientist and expert on Central Asia. Next is Yuri Poita from New Geopolitics Research Network, head of Asia Pacific section. Hello, you. Arseny Sivitsky, uh, co-founder and director of the Center for Strategic and Foreign Policy Studies. Vitaly Tsigankov, political observer of Radio Liberty, host of the program Razmova on Bilsat. Nekaterina Deikala, international lawyer, PhD in law. I would like to remind you that we have video re recording and the chat and rules apply on preliminary notifications. So if you don't want to be quoted, please let us know in advance. We'll pause the recording so that everybody else would know that they would they should not quote you on this. Also, would like to remind you that we have a English interpretation available. Please choose the appropriate channel in the Zoom settings. Please raise your um, hands, uh, write questions in the chat. My co-moderator today is Vadim Majeka. The floor is yours, Vadim, please. Hello and good evening, colleagues. Our main colleagues and guests are here with us. I'm glad to welcome you. The the first this year online session of the Expert Analytical Club. My name is Vadim Majeka. I represent the Belarusian Institute of Strategic Studies and the expert community of Belarus, our opinion. Anton represents Belarus Focus and Press Club. This session will start with the topic that uh, was uh, in the air it would be strange to talk about anything else this January. We'll do our best to just understand the consequence of the Kazakh protest. It's a wide topic. Uh, Colleagues, those of you who are not speaking, please turn, on, turn off your microphone to interfere with the recording. Thank you, Anton. Indeed, uh, it's too early to uh, try to understand what has been going on in Kazakhstan. It's uh, unraveling in front of our eyes. We'll do our best to understand what happened, why it happened, what could be the consequences and repercussions. We'll dwell on the CSTO peacekeeper sent to Kazakhstan. We'll discuss how legal it is. And we also discuss how it will affect Belarus. What would be the uh, conclusions made by the authorities and by the citizens of... It started so fast that uh, not so long ago, CSTO um, units were introduced and Today, we uh, read in the news that they were withdrawing. So it's unraveling very fast. So it's even more important for us to understand what's going on. If only to be more knowledgeable when we read the news. would like to remind you that all of you are pretty welcome to raise your hands, both uh, speakers and Uh, audience will also have separate q a session we'll start with a general framework try to discuss understand what it was exactly i uh, would like to give floor to arkady dubnov we're very happy that you managed to join us last time we met uh, we discussed uh, the cis and belarus relationship today it's kazakhstan on the agenda i know that you have been working and research in this region for a while. Let's understand what are the most important re uh, reasons for this protest, why it happened the way it did. And also, 
is the era of uh, Nazarbayev over or it's still in the air? The floor is yours, Arkady. Since we don't have too much time and we have a lot of speakers, I'll, I'll be brief. I think the listeners would like to understand what is happening, understand the general pictures, so will not reproduce it. I'll say right away that uh, I'll tell you what I think it, it's all about. I've been following it from the very beginning. It started with uh, social protests, which started on the 2nd of uh, January. January. As a result, Today, we can say that this story can be divided into four phases. None of these phases has anything to do with the external interference. So uh, let's not uh, think about any conspiracy theories here. Let's be condescending about uh, President Takayev, who had to claimed that it was basically the uh, external or international um, terrorist gangs. So we had to um, make a foundation for the CS2 forces sent to Kazakhstan and the so-called external aggression boiled to the mention of some uh, fighters of non-Kazakh origin. Indeed, there were some Kyrgyz fighters um, or protesters, Tajiks. So the first phase ended about uh, the 3rd or 4th of January, when the 30s were behaving indifferently uh, towards protest, the protests in the west of Kazakhstan. And uh, the protests were due to the 150% increase in the uh, natural gas prices, uh, automobile uh, liquid gas prices. And this uh, late reaction led to the protests covering the whole of Kazakhstan. So it started in the West and then uh, spread out further in the country. The reason was clear. For a long time in Kazakhstan, the, the issue of the protests have been uh, dormant, dormant for a number of reasons. There, are lots of, there were lots of facts confirming this. It started with the uh, Jaimuzian protest and the uh, executions there in 2011 shootings and then three years ago in the west there were also protests when the chinese or indian workers were brought there and uh, um, filled the working places of the kazakhs so the second phase was when the people took to the streets in kazakhstan they started to protest in the kazakh kazakh way uh, there were pogroms and uh, clashes with the police, Kazakhs and, I'm sorry, not Belarusians, there are Asians, it's the Asian format, it's the manly protest, when men try to sort it out, they uh, clash, they started uh, setting cars on fire, and do many other things. Takai uh, was still late. At first, he promised to uh, come up with uh, concrete reforms on uh, solutions to the economic problems. And he was also late when the political uh, demands were put forward. Uh, there was shall get, or the old man go away. Uh, slogans and this protest spread out uh, from the west the whole of the country 
Then Nazarbayev found out that uh, he was not coping with the situation. That's that that was when the third phase started. Uh, instead of the uh, young people who usually take to the streets to protest, the well-organized groups appeared. There were stocky stock stocky men, uh, well coordinated. They had concrete goals. They know knew where to go. They were professionally managed, and they were also armed with uh, lethal weapons. They secured the uh, Akemad building and the national state national security building in Almaty. Uh, those buildings were not protected or by the authorities because the, there was an order not to resist. On the 5th of January, there was a point of bifurcation. When the third phase started, uh, when Putin's prosecutor Peskov made a statement saying that uh, he hoped he, he was hoping that the Kazakhstan authorities were dealing, would deal with it, and there was no signs of external interference. And then all of a sudden, within several hours later, people were started dying in the streets. Nobody was resisting. Uh, law enforcement authority, law enforcement officers were not resisting, and the bandits occupied the cities. Takayev concluded that uh, the Siloviki was not uh, listening to him, he was losing power. He understood who was behind that. He understood very well that it was not the external forces, but the internal forces behind this. And it was uh, some of the younger lead from the Nazarbayev clan. And the next phase was counter coup. While the second phase was the semi coup phase, when Takayev were wanting to get rid of the cent second center of influence, then a face of Az Nazarbayev and uh, Nazarbayev's family members, uh, relatives understood that they could lose everything and decided to enter the fight. Yeah, using some criminals or Islamists and sportsmen talking about fighters. We know what happened late, uh, uh, then. Uh, forces were uh, involved. Peacekeeping forces. Uh, uh, the protesters understood that they couldn't uh, topple Takayev. Now it's the fourth phase that Takayev understands that if uh, foreign off forces remain the country, his legitimacy would be questioned. He understands that he feels that strong pressure coming from beneath, not from the societies and such, but uh, from the young people. Who, uh, the guy understands that he would be uh, toppled by the leader because he uh, uh, allowed the Russians to end Russian forces to enter the country. And it's uh, unacceptable for the country that is uh, f uh, worried about the Russian influence. Uh, we're witnessing the fourth phase now. Uh, hopefully, it's probably will end soon. If uh, somebody wants to say that it's a uh, defeat of Putin, uh, they are wrong. It's the victory of Putin. Many understood, understand why. I can un explain why if you want. Thank you very much, Arkady, for this uh, division to phases. Also, could you also tell us what is the connection between the relatives of Nazarbayev, who look like the well of oligarchs? Or and uh, the so-called uh, Titushki or the uh, rural area, guys from rural areas. What is the connection there? Particularly when we talk about that uh, those uh, rural areas guys were, rednecks were 
managed somehow and pushed and directed. Talking about the younger generation of the Kazarbayev's relatives, the uh, nephews, 43-year-old general, his uh, son of his youngest brother who died in 1980, and General Kairatas, who is a yes, billionaire. The Baldi is uh, well-known in Kazakhstan for um, working with being close to Salafites. He was at some point under their influence, the Islamic movement. And um, in this respect, he, he was the chair on the, of the fight uh, fighting federation that had uh, about 5,000 people who were reared in the spirit of this Salafite uh, ideology. Nazarbayev uh, was told about that in the past, but Nazarbayev didn't want to resist that. And I think these guys uh, uh, were the driving force of those battalions. The I Sultan Nazarbayev, uh, the son of uh, his oldest daughter, who recently died in London, spoke about this. And uh, rumor has it that uh, he died uh, because he made public the information of uh, the preparation of such fighters, uh, in special camps outside Almata. He said that they were getting ready to fight at some point. To support Nazarbayev's clan. Here's the connection. And this explains the misgivings of, um, and fears of Putin. That uh, after Nazarbayev was toppled, the unclear regime would take over Kazakhstan, there is some Turkish influence and Islamic influence. It is clear that Moscow was not happy about this prospect. It was quite obvious. Takaya was a, a legitimate president who Russia, Russia wanted to support. We have Pavel Bukowski, a journalist who wanted to ask something. Good evening, everyone, Arkady. My question is, do you expect that there will be division of property after the Kyiv remains in power? There were various opinions about that. Some say that he will adhere to the agreements or he will play his own game. That's a very good question. Both trends are visible now. There is some trend for of uh, redistribution of property and some limitations of oligarchs, an attempt to force oligarchs to share their wealth. It has, made a, has been made public, but that's the uh, maximum. And the minimal steps would be to just understand that that's uh, not entirely possible. The second trend is that what we're witnessing now, uh, that is that Takayev is uh, trying to clumsily follow the internal agreements inside the elite, according to which he is to keep the image and aura of Azerbaijan for as the father of the nation and to be careful with this myth because if we if the, we if they claim that Nazarbayev was the destroyer and destructed the country destroyed the country uh, that would be a blow for the Kazakhstan sovereignty so uh, they need to take this myth of Nazarbayev power to the side. 
particularly to protect the people who have the same last name. Well, same thing happened in China. Mao is on one hand a criminal, on the other hand, is a founder of the modern China. Is a Muslim in Tiananmen and the square and is still revered, revered and is still a symbol of the modern China. This similar attempt is made here. It looks very clumsy on the background of uh, incomplete information about the whereabouts of Nazarbayev and his health. So uh, the charges of uh, coup put against Kasimov, head of the security service, is nothing like, is nothing but an attempt to uh, protect the nephews of Nazarbayev or aides to Masimov. Thank you very much, uh, Pavlyuk, for the question. Let's move on. Uh, let's discuss the, the same question with uh, Yuri. Yuri, what do you think uh, could be other reasons for the turmoil? What could be the repercussions? Also, will be possible to separate the myth of both Nazarbayev and the concrete people that have some political weight and um, related to Nazarbayev. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. For about two and a half years, I lived in, in Almata. Yeah, I left this city. I was uh, uh, busy writing my doctoral thesis in the local university. I also took part in a number of research projects. Among them, the project about the protesting potential. It's difficult to analyze the situation, although we do have some elements. Arkady uh, showed us what uh, the past and the potential future. The general trends are clear, but it's very difficult to analyze what's happening because the internal um, connections in between the elites, uh, between the family members of Nazarbayev and others uh, remain closed and uh, un unclear. The analysis is uh, based on the statements of uh, high-ranking military officials uh, and those of the experts, analysts. So it's very difficult to analyze the situation. It's very easy to follow the wrong narrative who is being spread by the authorities and some uh, centers of power. Again, analyze the situation using the telegram channels and the information there very difficult because this every second message there uh, is uh, fake. So I made a timeline based on three key elements. The first one being the mass protest that we have been witnessing. The second is the struggle of elites. I think nobody would um, say that it's not happening. And the third one is the external uh, influence. I agree here with Rakaji, who says that the, uh, the foreign influence is clearly the, an influence from Russia. And for me, the question is how these three elements are interconnected, what is the primary reason and what is the consequence? as far as the mass protests are uh, concerned. I uh, researched the protesting potential of Kazakhstan in one of my projects. And as far as the protest potential is, uh, goes, it, again, it's difficult to analyze it because the open sociology is almost non-existent in Kazakhstan, particularly that of legitimizing or delegitimizing the certain uh, economic and political groups in power. So as far as the protest potential goes, according to some sociologists, 
experts who have been dealing with this, working with this for a while, the, gro the pro protestant mood was increasing and so was the protest potential. There are several uh, protests to analyze them. One is based on economic unhappiness, the theory of unhappiness and the deprivation, which says that if the society uh, is financially unhappy, they're inclined to protest. This theory doesn't work in Kazakhstan. It works different way in other countries. Let's take Tajikistan with the low uh, uh, quality of life. Uh, there are almost no protests. Similar things uh, happen in Kazakhstan. The, the protest theorist says that the main driver on one of them is the theory of political opportunities. So in democratic regimes, the authorities uh, allow for more protests and activities. The protests are, in fact, the channel of communication between the citizens and the authorities. It's one of the channels uh, used to show unhappiness. In, while well, in authoritarian systems, the authorities, they limit the protesting activities because they believe uh, that they are a threat to them, to their livelihood. In such systems, the protests occur uh, much more seldom, but if they do, uh, there's a much chance that they could lead to the revolutionary coup and the change of the regime. So as far as the Kazakhstan is concerned, I think we're witnessing here uh, the main driver of the protest activity that took to the streets several weeks ago. It's all due to the peculiarities of the political regime because we know that the authorities are cut away from the society, the rest of the society, and the effective communication channels are non existent. And the authorities do, do, and the uh, people do not delegate their representatives to the power even though uh, the concept of the um, sensitive state or the authorities that would be listening to the moods of the people uh, was read, it was not a success. So the local authorities are not also held in high esteem and by the people because Akims are appointed, not uh, elected. Last year, the Akims was started to be elected and the rest uh, are Kim's uh, representatives of the president, but they're not very effective in working with the people. The second element, like uh, the struggle of elites, shows that we have uh, well, we in the absence of Yelbasi, the leader of the nation in the information space. And as far as I understand, uh, during the acute phase of the political crisis, he should have, have made a statement and found a consensus. He should have assumed the responsibility, but he never did it. And uh, many questions rise. Possibly the struggle of elites is uh, not the consequences of the mass protest, but rather the reason for them. It's hard to say, but we do see uh, the gradual removal uh, of people who are close to the Nostan Zabayev, removal from their positions, like Karim Masim, who is uh, currently charged with uh, uh, plotting a coup. The third element is the influence of the Russian Federation. We know that uh, the, the Russia is the main player in this field, and uh, the Takayevs uh, was quick to turn to Russia for assistance. And this is the all forces and Russian forces, particularly when it's very to take control over the situation. The CSTO's response was swift, and within 24 hours, the forces was sent to Kazakhstan. So the Russian factor 
uh, is uh, one of the key factors made of uh, in the system made of three elements. What could be the consequences of this is hard to say, but uh, clearly the Russia was ex exercised more influence on the country and the, the authorities and the military officials of Kazakhstan. I think these are the main points. Maybe some of you have questions at this point. Thank you, Yuri. We will have a Q&A session in the second part of our meeting. Right. Uh, we have discussed uh, several points already and uh, mentioned how quick the decision to inter send the CSTO forces was taken. Let's now uh, move to the second question. Uh, here I want to turn to Yekaterina. Deikala, uh, a lawyer who would tell us more about the CSTO. Many uh, people present here, like me, are not particularly uh, knowledgeable in the international law. So what was the reason for all of this? I mean, the situation seemed uh, quite legal, but you wrote that uh, the nature of the legal nature is something that we may question here. What kind of consequences may have the long-term consequences for the region as a whole and the separate countries in particular? Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Vadim, for inviting me. Indeed, I did write a big paper a big, about the, one of the legal aspects of the situation um, on Facebook. You can read it there, but in a nutshell, I would like to mention some other points that are important here. The situation with the launching of the system mechanism, it illustrates very well and shows very well what is happening in the state and post-Soviet states kept in the post-Soviet paradigm. Uh, that are still in the Russian sphere of influence. The states who are not used to perceive the law as an element of management and uh, a limitation to the authorities. And they also uh, shift this approach to the international borders and structures. Why is it happening this way? It's important to understand the context because here we witness a very deep uh, meanings and deep of uh, the transportation uh, transformation. On the one hand, these states are in a, in a contradictory position. On the one hand, they are part of the global world. They don't live in the forest, they don't live in the cave. So they have to follow certain rules. They create CSTO and uh, um, put their certain articles in the uh, agreement. These things, uh, they follow the framework and the standards of the international standards. On the other hand, uh, they don't think they're bound by by this framework and they follow their own steps and, uh, and we see a lot of commentary saying that the international law uh, is obsolete and uh, the right of the strong is predominant now. So I don't think we should uh, comment on that because there are lots of people who devalue, devalue uh, the, the law, in the international, international law in particular. It's important to understand that this legal framework has not only the technical function, 
whether something corresponds or doesn't correspond, but it uh, has an element of mechanisms. Without a doubt, every legal norm may be violated and broken. But what we're talking here is uh, it's important to understand how we perceive the legal norms, what they are there for. As to the peacekeeping forces sent to Kazakhstan, uh, Pashinyan referred to the Article 4 in the CESTO agreement, which is connected with the Article 51 of the UN Charter. It's important to understand that every regional collective security organization does not operate separately. It cannot follow their own rules. It follows uh, the international system of the security, national security in the framework of the United Nations. Uh, the Security Council is responsible for that. Its charter has a, a description when the particular measure should be applied, involved in force or not. And the regional security organizations, uh, they are created based on the fourth article of the charter, aimed at creating mechanisms that um, are add-ons to the universal system because the universal system cannot always react and see what is happening locally. So the CSTO is one of those organizations. It has a declaration on cooperation with the United Nations, uh, where it says that it follows the UN Charter and Chapter 8 in particular. They're supposed to act uh, the framework of the charter. So the idea of the fourth article of the CSTO referred to the 51st article of the UN Charter, although uh, the latter article is the is special. And uh, only in cases stipulated by the Article 51, uh, you can act uh, without consent from uh, the Security Council, but you need to inform it in beforehand. So it's in a case of exception. Assisting all countries created this very agreement because they could create anything else. It is a framework and then it they could have written that they could do whatever they wanted, you know, just uh, send forces wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted. The right for collective self-defense involves the external attack or interference. It's considered only in this way. It's not my explanation. I can, in uh, article, Pashinyan refers to the Article 4 of the treaty, see, still treaty. It's a fact. Uh, without a doubt, just like colleagues mentioned before me, none of these uh, conditions were followed and uh, observed. There were no external aggression, external interference. Without a doubt, going back to the procedure, uh, I must say that nobody informed the Security Council of the United Nations, which must be done according to the Article 4 referred to by Pashinyan. This is a binding norm that wasn't followed. Another procedural, procedural thing that wasn't followed and that was due to the uh, um, non-willingness to follow any norms. According to the Pashinyam's statement published on the 6th of January, uh, it said after Takayev's 
application, they decided to withdraw the forces. So first, Takayev wanted to have uh, forces introduced or involved and then withdrawn. The national organization, when they uh, make a decision like that, they need to follow the charter. And uh, the situation that do you need to be considered. Indeed, there's a lot of commentary, a lot of people saying that the Kaya was the person who asked for the troops to be sent. We must understand that there are a lot of other legitimate ways to provide for the military presence of uh, Russian forces in Kazakhstan, like make an agreement to place military bases. But if you want to involve the mechanism of Article 4, that has a concrete meaning and as a concrete reference to Article 51. Moreover, it says that all these actions were, should be in line with UN Charter. You need to understand there is a clear-cut algorithm, you cannot just violate it. So we all understand very well that what was behind that decision, even though there are a number of legal ways to uh, have Russian forces in Kazakhstan, we I have a feeling, not only me, that it was important to involve this particular mechanism for self-defense the CSTO mechanism. There are a number of various viewpoints, and I'm not a political scientist, but it's clear that they needed to, and they wanted to involve this particular mechanism. Again, as, as far as the procedure is concerned, we don't say a single document, a mandate. In order to say that whether it was done in the framework of the CSTO Charter, uh, it was clearly a violation of this of this agreement. Of, we see that uh, there was a passage based on the, saying that the, the forces, the military forces, were sent there based on the call from Takayev, and same is true about the withdrawal. Uh, to avoid the double standards, there are a lot of decisions by NATO and uh, decisions by uh, the Security Council when he says that, which are dubious, but still, if we visit the NATO website, we'll see uh the list of all the peacekeeping operations that the current uh, that ended and the concrete resolutions of uh, the security council with mandate when we talk about the security council decisions we see the concrete resolutions with the mandates with the flags we will understand who is responsible for that that's as far as the reporting and the transparency are concerned in this case this all has been violated and it's unclear what kind of mandate this mission has. You did break the Article 4 and the statute, uh, the charter. What kind of mandate it has? Uh, Mr. Z we saw today the statement by Zeiss about the withdrawal of force. They said that the aim of the mission was as follows. So where's this aim? This is goal, and they say that the, we, it, it was a success. So, where's the mandate? Where's the mandate? Again, the decision-making process uh, here is particularly interesting. While CSTO norms say that they need to refer to Article Fifty-One. But since the, these people don't understand what kind of procedure 
as a limiting factor. Don't see it this way. In the decision making statement, they uh, said that it's made through consensus, just like in NATO. But then it says that the decision making is made in the limited format, but it's unclear what kind of a limited format is meant. Then it says that the decision making in the limited format uh, is possible only if all the members of the organization agree to it unanimously. But the next passage next uh, states that whoever is doesn't agree to this is not responsible for it. So if you don't want to participate in something, we'll do it without you and uh, you will not be held responsible, but we'll be covered with your name. We'll cover ourselves with your name. I guess this was the limited, this notorious limited format based on the statute. So it turns out that Belarus can do something in this history work in the limited format. So that's all I wanted to say, basically. Thank you very much. Indeed, starting from the abstract understanding that the Kaif invited the sister forces, we now understand that there was no a legal mandate for that, and the legal procedures were not observed. We see that there was no understanding why uh, the force was sent there and how it was done. Right, next, uh, Arsene Sivitsky, since he works in the area of international security, not so long ago, Arseny visited Kazakhstan and it was at the conference there. So, how legal was it? What will be the consequences of, is this CSTO turning into a club of the scared dictators, or I prefer uh, the sacred union of the 19th century? when they say that we'll be protecting each other from everyone else because we're good and they're bad. So what kind of future, what does the future hold for this CSTO? Thank you, Vadim and colleagues. Uh, good evening once again. I'll start with uh, a small um, disclaimer uh, statement. And at the end of November, I uh, visited the conference in Kazakhstan about uh, political system of Kazakhstan. President Takayev came up with another package of uh, political reforms aimed at democratize, uh, democratizing the public life and f f further enrollment of the Kazakhstan citizens into the decision-making process. And nothing actually there and then could say that uh, that uh, there will be a crisis in Kazakhstan very soon. But the conference happened a week after the Yelbasi, the Sultan Nazarbayev, uh, left the, the position of the uh, major party governance and he gave it to Takayev. Uh, clearly there was a tension in the air because this position of that Takayev occupied by Takayev was supposed to be elected at the party meeting. And uh, the, we had a feeling that something was wrong because the, there was no meeting session planned. And nobody could predict the time that this would provoke a big fire, a big crisis. In order to interpret the events, and particularly the participation of the CS2 troops in the conflict, I uh, would like to 
give an assessment to, to what has happened. And indeed, I think it's not that much about the protests that became the driving factor of the current crisis, but uh, the some tensions between the elites that was uh, grown mm, or building up in the last several years. Something happened between 28th of December and 1st January with the first president of Kazakhstan, Yelbasir or Nasaltan Nazarbayev. On the 28th of December, he was seen for the last time in public. I would like to remind you that one of the hypotheses uh, here is that, that he could have suffered uh, some blow to his health or uh, even died. And this could actually trigger the war inside the country that uh, added up to the, the growing protest moves. On the one hand, it, uh, just like my colleague said, it was uh, due to the mm, economic, uh, unpopular economics decisions like the increased prices for uh, the liquid gas, more than uh, double. On the other hand, we see that the, this protest dynamic, dynamics was operated by the fight in elite groups, which was obvious uh, when we think about the slogan changes. From this point of view, I think it's important to consider the fact that the CSTO made decision on the sending the peacekeeping troops and not the collective troops of quick deployment of this. The thing is, the official versions of the events portrayed by Mr. Takayev would involve these two components. peacekeeping forces and the collective forces of rapid reaction because it presupposes the participation in the operation of country terrorist operations, uh, operations against terrorists, but it was the peacekeeping forces that were involved. And I think that uh, here we see the prompt to understand what is happening, what happened at the beginning of the year. Basically, it was internal civil conflict that uh, required peacekeeping forces to be sent there, not only not so much to secure the critical infrastructure uh, facilities, but also to, they were supposed to divide the fighting parties. It happened very fast, uh, within uh, 24 hours, uh, which shows that in Moscow, Moscow knew very well what was happening between the elites, and they knew that it would uh, grow into another civil conflict in the region or in the country. And uh, here I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that there, uh, there's an agreement the framework of the CSTO on peacekeeping activities was signed in 2013, which says, uh, which lays out uh, the procedure on decision making when peacekeeping forces are concerned. I will read you uh, the Article 3 of this agreement, which says that the decision to conduct peacekeeping operation in the territories of the member countries is taken by the CSTO based on the uh, local legislation, based on the official application of the member state 
or based on the decision by the Security Council of the United Nations uh, about the peacekeeping operation, not part of the CSTO. From the formal point of view, this institutional mechanism was uh, observed. And here we must uh, answer the question why it was important to involve peacekeeping forces to uh, stop this crisis and not the collective forces of rapid reaction. I think the answer is uh, lying on the surface. The Kremlin views this crisis as a, uh, a result, among other things, of the internal inter-clan struggle and uh, they involve this tool in order to support some to keep the balance and uh, not to uh, like the clan struggle to transform into a new civil conflict god forbid or uh, some long-term conflict at the same time i think that this uh, The counter-revolution mentioned by Arkady won. And from this point of view, we can uh, say that the Kremlin in, in this inter-clan struggle, they uh, supported Mr. Takayev. and the presence of the peacekeeping forces and contingent uh, allowed to prevent any attempt to take revenge by the, the Nazarbayev relatives. What should we expect next to happen? I uh, think that the Russia didn't insist on keeping the forces there be it on the ages of the CSTO or the national forces. The uh, Kremlin understood that it would be an unpopular decision. Um, by doing this, they will frame President Takayev. So I think that if no incident happened, there were no terrorist acts or any revenge or vengeance operations by 19th of January, the forces will leave Kazakhstan. In the future, there'll be uh, attempts to build, uh, rebuild the bilateral relations with Kazakhstan. And the main focus will be made here on uh, creating the joined military components, military units, following the model uh, already practiced uh, with Belarus on the one hand, on the other hand with Armenia. So we're talking here about uh, creating coalition uh, forces and the joined uh, air defense uh, system with the center being in Moscow. When the crisis is over, the Kremlin will, the, will prompt the discussion about the permanent presence of the military forces. And uh, currently Kremlin sees the placement of military bases in post-Soviet state as the certain guarantee that allows them to um, put this or that country in their sphere of influence. Because in the case of the Central Asia, it's not, it's not only about the geopolitical competition with uh, the West, but it's also about China, about Turkey, which are actively penetrating the region. 
their influence is not limited only by the development of the trade relations, but we see that the China and Turkey are actively increasing their uh, military influence and uh, military cooperation. And the China is creating paramilitary facilities. If we talk about the experience of or case of Tajikistan. Right, I think I'll stop here. No, I'm not going to go deeper into the consequences for Belarus. If there are some additional questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Arseny. I saw Arkady and Yekaterina raised in hands, and I think they wanted to add something about the UN Charter being more important than the cis Treaty. Let's follow the same order, Arkady, first, please. Arkady, please unmute yourself. Thank you very much. I think Svetlana was uh, very precise in uh, um, focusing on the vulnerable points of decision-making process. On the one, on the other hand, non-parliamentary, uh, basically the Kremlin doesn't care about them. This is a new paradigm of the Russian diplomacy. Uh, we should be ready for it to be ignored such uh, claims that the UN procedures were not followed. As to the Arseny in his uh, statement, I would uh, contradict him. On the one hand, first and foremost, the units that were sent to Kazakhstan, as uh, some military, Russian military experts in Russia say, are not peaceful. The only peaceful contingents in Russia works in Kazakhstan, operates in Kazakhstan. It was a daily special unit that uh, is fully placed in, uh, deployed in southern Caucasus. The units that were operating in Kazakhstan, they are called peaceful peacekeeping. I think it was Putin who called them peacekeeping. It's, uh, I don't think they're truly peacekeeping. Peacekeeping units have special preparation. Uh, among other things, they are trained to work with uh, uh, non-military population or civilians. And here I would contradict Arseny, who said that they came to divide the parties in Kazakhstan, there are no parties that need to be uh, put to the sides. There is uh, authorities who no longer have the power they used to have, no longer have the resources they used to have. They need an extra support for their resources. And there are some peaceful protests. Uh, uh, there were people who were oppressed. And there is a uh, hundred uh, of people uh, who were used by the people who wanted to make this not counter revolution, but counter coup. There was not a revolution. As I said, there was an attempt to stage a coup that was aiming to deal with the people in the power who were against them. So it was a counter coup with the participation of the CS2 forces. So I repeat that there was no revolution, hence no counter revolution. There was no driving force for the revolution because the revolution must have a driving force. There's no opposition. There was no opposition as such because opposition is someone who puts uh, forward some political slogans. The dismissal 
this mission, this missile of government was one of the slogans and uh, like shall kill get but it was limited jambalat mamai who had uh, was the leader of the democratic party non-systemic party Muhtar Ablyazov is the person who wants to be the main opposition leader but isn't again i repeat that there's no civil society in kazakhstan there are some activists some protesters and people who are unhappy with this status quo so there are no sides particularly uh, when we talk about the militarized sides again i repeat that we need to be careful about the naming things uh, like a revolution and others. Thank you, Arkady, Katerina, please. Thank you very much. I would like to contradict, uh, oppose the views of Arseny in the following way. Indeed, the treaty that you quoted, it does exist, and the difference between those forces does exist. But uh, this again confirms what I said about the un unclear nature of the mandate and the reasons that are quite vague. There's no mandate would describe the reason for sending the troops. The only thing we have is the statement signed by Pashnyon and uh, placed on the CSTO site uh, on the 6th of January, which has reference not on the, to the statement that you quoted, but the Article 4 of the CSTO. And this article, this article clearly refers to the Article 51 of the Charter. There's no division uh, into various kind of forces. It's a clear-cut mechanism. Maybe they wanted to one, have one thing and they referred to something else. It's it's no longer material because it was mentioned in the Article 4 of the CSTO. And uh, it was that algorithm that was launched as a, a non-professional political analyst, I could say that it was their aim, it was their goal, they wanted to play the NATO. But I'm uh, not saying the, that my opinion is exhaustive. But from the point of view of the law, we cannot say that uh, any treaty says that this could be done based on the application of one of the parties. Again, it's important to know that Arkady mentioned that, that uh, Kremlin doesn't care. It is obvious, but we must understand when we talk about the law and the legal bodies, their attitude is one thing, but our attitude is something else. We must understand what is good and what is bad. This is very important. to understand. Thank you, Katerina. And that indeed we have a very interesting picture when it's unclear what kind of external enemies are there. It's also unclear what kind of article was used to send forces there. So a lot of vague points. I'll be brief uh, defending my position. I believe that indeed in Kazakhstan, there was the coup. At the same time, Uh, this palace revolution, the coup d'etat, uh, uh, was something they they predicted, and uh, Nusultan Nazarbayev's health condition or maybe death uh, played a role there. This, this is still with the Russian prevalence was sent there to first, if needed to uh, 
if crisis turns into some conflict, they were aimed to stop in it. There was plan that was supposed to stop it. There could be a conflict between Takayev and the forces loyal to him. I mean the the military conflict because we there was a military uh, protest uh, when the situation would stabilize. It was supposed to be a form of supporting Takayev, uh, protecting him from the possible revenge or revenge from the Nazarbayev's relatives and family. This is my interpretation. The situation has stabilized now. Uh, it's, uh, clearly, the forces can be withdrawn now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arseny. As I see it, if we believe this something happened to, with Nazarbayev, and with every day we uh, believe more and more that something did happen, everyone did what they planned. Some plan to do something when Yabasi goes away, uh, so did Moscow. Each party played the role. I now want to give floor to the third question, to move to the third question, how it will affect Belarus and what conclusions will be made by uh, the Belarusian authorities and the Belarusian society. Because everyone who criticized Belarusian protests said, uh, look at Kazakhstan, you should have followed this pattern. And others said that look at Kazakhstan, you shouldn't have done this way. I think everybody made a uh, drew a lesson and uh, obviously Lukashenko is observing this situation in Kazakhstan. So Vitaly, what do you think about that? How it will reflect on the Belarus? What kind of behavior it could provoke? kind of mood it can provoke. But please turn on your microphone. Thank you very much. When um, this conference was announced, there were some ironic comments in Facebook saying that uh, you are not experts in Kazakhstan, but it turned out we do have experts on CISTO and uh, but I've been an expert on Lukashenko. I've been following this character since 1990s, not since 1994 even, but since 1991. And I've been, have had a negative stance to him since then. We'll talk about the influence of events in Kazakhstan and Belarus. I think Belarus has already sp spoken about the main thing. particularly the peaceful, non-peaceful protest. For a day or two, there was uh, people were impressed by what people protesting in Kazakhstan were doing based on the short-term and long-term results. This infatuation disappeared and Belarusians reassessed the peaceful protest in uh, 2020. Well, let's remember the abstract figures uh, political scientists say that uh, when the protests radicalized, the number of people who want to take part in it, they goes down drastically. In Kazakhstan, we saw the hundreds of thousands of people. There were, there were no hundreds of thousands of people that took to the streets in Belarus. But we, let's not compare the events in those countries because expert who sp spoke before me said that it wasn't a revolution, it was the palace revolution, silent coup. Still, the wider public, uh, the parallels have been drawn 
neither of the protests achieved the results that the protesters wanted, but there were more negative results brought uh, uh, by the Kazakhstan protest than uh, the Belarusian protest. And this abstract, abstract thought that Putin would involve forces or would send their forces have been, has been around since 2015. For the first time uh, since 2006 and 2010 elections in Belarus, the uh, mass protest uh, was not particularly discussed on the election day because uh, everyone was afraid of Putin's sending forces. Uh, slowly, uh, this fear dissipated, but Putskasantistas had it. We must say that the events in Kazakhstan added value to the statement by people who said that a Belarusian protest developed further and Minsk, uh, Moscow would send its forces to Minsk. No matter whatever you call it, peacekeeping forces or something else. The second question is also very important, how Lukashenko perceives events in Kazakhstan. I think it's more obvious here. It's widely discussed. I wouldn't uh, say anything new here, but I would sum up what has been said. The fact that when Lukashenko started uh, discussing the transit of power and what was said in uh, August, September that the constitution draft was ready and they were ready to hold the referendum, several month, months later when everything was ready the this draft voting was postponed and only in december it was made public to the which shows that lukashenko is still in doubt he still does not know what it will lead to when experts uh, said with limitations that uh, the Belarusian approach is similar to Kazakhstan. We are creating the all Belarusian meeting uh, headed by the, the president of Belarus or the former president of Belarus. It's very much reminds the uh, of the Kazakhstan approach, Kazakhstan approach, and Lukashenko is trying to understand how this approach worked or did not work in Kazakhstan. What risks emerge uh, while uh, before uh, in the past there were some issues connected with the Nazarbayev family that did not allow for such change to happen in the past. And Lukashenko th is thinking about the referendum, the connected with the, the constitution draft. Again, we witnessed the procrastination. Lukashenko is thinking about some uh, about year 2025 and about how to leave his post, how to leave it quietly, how to go away quietly. Uh, if we consider more generalized, the most strategic level, we see that this Kazakhstan story shows that the authoritarian rulers are very pitiful. And they have been pitiful the last decades. Their ruling is never quiet. They're accompanied by some legal issues or attempts to find a, a position that would uh, allow them to stay in power and uh, leave the, the post at the same time. It uh, very often uh, ends uh, dramatically or tragically. Hence, we need to understand this is 
what's happening you don't have to be a dr shigelsky or psychiatrist or psychologist to understand that it is now uh, a concentration that what is lukashenko which is obvious obviously seen in his statements and uh, why was it he actively supporting the sending of military units to kazakhstan they called it uh, peacekeeper troops, whether they were peacekeeping or not. The Russian press said that there was Lukashenko who initiated this. There were two reasons. One is uh, that Lukashenko wanted to get stuck in the Central Asia. He also said that Uzbekistan will be next, and we need to support Uzbekistan. Uh, so basically, it meant that uh, Russia, please deal with this region and forget about me and uh, forget about my transfer power, whatever you wanted from me. He could have had this motivation because indeed he was very active, actively in assuming this role. Secondly, this can be called uh, the solidarity of. Uh, autocrats or dictators uh, because in the past system was weak and passive did not have help armenia uh well now it's it's uh, supporting one of the system member heads to stay in power and may as well happen that system will help to correct leader in the future, same way. I think these motives are obvious. Thank you, Vitaly. Indeed, uh, this is still turning to the protective tool for dictators. Makes me remember the words of the founder of BISS, Vitaly Sivisky, who said that the, who spoke about the parent of authoritarianism. CSTO is becoming a mechanism of such kind, be becomes an embodiment that allows autocrats, dictators to help each other. Before we start the Q&A session, I wanted to ask you if you wanted to add something about the influence of situation on Belarus and uh, on what Belarusian authorities or people living in Belarus think. Arsenia, I think you wanted to add something. Uh, we see Artem Schreiber and Yuri de Krustman, our participants. Maybe Yuri could add something about Belarus. Or Arsenia, maybe you have something else to tell us. Right, I will add the following. I think that the situation in Kazakhstan will uh, uh, force Belarusian authorities to put off the transit of power for five or ten years. The time will show whether it's easy to implement or not. But based on the constitutional draft that has been made public, uh, here we agree with uh, Vitaly, who said that uh, indeed there is no clear-cut concept of how this a power transit will happen, particularly its consequences. Lukashenko doesn't have any idea how to do it. it. Means that instead of some brisk experiments, and I think Nazar, the transit of Nazarbayev is perceived in this way in Minsk, it will be it will be decided to freeze the situation get back to it in 2025 depending on uh, the foreign the situation outside belarus i have a question right away there's a general opinion prompted by the business in sochi and their interpretation that the transit of power is something that mm, what uh, russia wanted uh, demanded if Lukashenko 
is not concerned with the mean opinion of society. Can he ignore the opinion of Kremlin or was there not such an opinion in the first place? I believe that uh, undoubtedly Moscow will put pressure on Belarus and the fact that Belarus has not received 3.5 billion US dollars to refinance Russian debt shows that uh, Russian authorities are following this line, uh, the trying to force Lukashenko to launch this process of power transfer. But the events in Kazakhstan, they've uh, forced Lukashenko to think twice and to doubt uh, the, the necessity of such transit, because it turns out that the plans of power transit that were initiated by Nazarbayev a long time ago were used uh, by Russia by supporting uh, the critical moment, not Nazarbayev and his family, but uh, the new president of the country, uh, Takayev and his successor. Uh, I think it's just a big challenge for Lukashenko. And since Kremlin, on the one hand, keeps this issue on the agenda, I mean, the issue of the political reform and power transit in Belarus. On the other hand, Lukashenko will probably not said wants to satisfy these demands. And it's obvious that the relationship between Moscow and Minsk will be becoming more and more conflicted in 2022, particularly after the referendum is held. And as far as the CSTO is concerned, I think that the only reason why the Russia decided to project a force using the CSTO contingent and uh, not to send its own forces, it, is, it has to do with the fact that this desire to camouflage uh, the Russian initiative and the Russian participation. Moreover, like uh, Arkady said, the Russian military presence in Kazakhstan would be treated in much more aggressive way than uh, the presence of CSTO contingent would. And we also saw that Russia is very selective in using this precious toolkit. In the case of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, we saw that Russia basically ignored the application of the Armenian side. Not only those that were made uh, in CSTO, but also based on the bilateral agreements. Armenia and Russia also have the joint military force, the single anti-aircraft system. So saying that CSTO has been into the autocracy defend, defendant element is too early. In our chat, we already have several questions. Let's discuss them. I see Yuri Dekakros who wanted to ask something. Yuri, are you here with us? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I want to have a question to Arkady about uh, one of the stages of the crisis. He mentioned that it was an uh, under coup. Saying wasn't it's not was not a uh, uh, fully fledged. Who, we must say that there was a, a curtailed uh, introduction of the forces. Many thought about the Hungary and 
Czechoslovakia in 1960s and uh, for tanks and on land, but the scales are in, difficult to compare. 20 Soviet divisions were introduced in Hungary and uh, 16 Soviet divisions were uh, sent to Czechoslovakia. I think in this case we have about 2.5. Thousand people, so it's not like it's nothing like twenty and seventeen divisions. So the Soviet logic was that uh, if you do something, go all in in terms of this situation. The approach was uh, similar to those uh, um, described by Saltykov Shedrin. Why was this approach enough, do you think? Thank you very much for the question uh, with the references. Thank you, Yuri, for the question. Using your reference to my description and my definition, and this has been the uh, an, a reaction. Uh, I must say that it was the empire that reacted in uh, Hungary and, and uh, Czechoslovakia. And what we have now is not a true empire, hence the not particularly fully fledged approach. And then a lot was uh, on the table. They were defending the socialism they were defending the results of the, the achievements of the Second World War. And now the Kazakhstan is in our pocket. In particular, that's what Russia thinks. Secondly, if you remember, there was a, a, a problem at the beginning. At first, they uh, it sent not only the Soviet troops, but also the East Germany troops, but immediately they were sent back. It was decided not to send the German troops to Czechoslovakia again, like it was during the Second World War. Now, as far as the situation is concerned, I believe that Putin uh, should be happy about the results because uh, this contingent, this forces staying in Asia, in Kazakhstan, uh, would very much remind us of what happened in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. And uh, they uh, could uh, react to what was. Uh, happening in Kazakhstan, and, and I repeat that uh, the forces that were sent there were not truly peacekeeping. They did not have the training. Luckily, in Kazakhstan, uh, there were only moods and not civil society that was, was ready to uh, pro protest and uh, resist the uh, Russian forces. And Putin's willy-nilly was uh, deprived of the possibilities of doing what we want he wanted and uh, also he took the gun out of the pocket while in the past he it looked like empty threads he this time he showed the, the gun and he said that you guys need to understand that if it goes this way, nobody will stop me. I will do what I want. Uh, even though there is a number of procedural uh, inconsistencies, Putin didn't care about that. Putin showed the world, among other things, that uh, CSTO is a great A tool to set a ultimatums 
particularly when he's dealing with the West. Not so long ago, he said that I, he demanding, he's demanding a particular attitude to the countries like Kazakhstan or former Soviet countries. Basically, he said the Yankees go home. Don't you dare approach in these countries. Don't you dare approach these countries. Thank you, Arkady. Some question from Artyom Shaiban. Could you please uh, ask a question yourself? Thank you very much, Vadim. It might be too noisy here. My question is simple. Question to Arkady. Uh, uh, important of this crisis was the element of sending forces. The psychological role is clear and probably the task behind it. But assessing the position of Takai for the time, do you think he would lose power if sister forces did not go there? Was he on the verge of falling down so much that he had to ask foreign forces to interfere? Artem, thank you very much for your question. I think that it's a very much uh, valid question. Indeed, I think that uh, the sky would lose his position. It will end badly, not only for him, but also for Putin. Because Putin doesn't know how to work with people he doesn't really understand. He did understand what kind of person Takai was, even though uh, he may not have liked him uh, that much. He understood that Takai started in Gimo. He was you know, very much uh, clear cut. If Putin allowed the protesters to topple, Takayev, even though when the it was uh, in the soft core or place revolution, uh, that would be a bad sign for Putin and for Russia. The Russian population would uh, see that, uh, would think that in a relatively well off country like Kazakhstan, even though it's uh, hard to compare with the GDP of Russia, the people would see that the toppling power, popular authority is possible. It wasn't very much in his interest. At the CSTO summit, he said that, did you see what the protest could lead to? The social protest could lead to. This was actually what he thought about what was happening. It's very much important element for the guidelines the Kremlin is spreading with distributing among journalists like Kisilov. Uh, right in this case, it's uh, interesting uh, who would replace Takayev because these um, people, the protests, did not have a leader, and the majority of their protests were not in the capital where Takayev was. What would be the mechanism of toppling him? Who would come into power? If we're talking about the inter clan struggle uh, and the uh, Saviki from the Nazarbayev clan would come to power, the, there will not be a problem for Putin. This is both true and false. I already said that the Nazarbayev was very much a Soviet person, uh, but his darlings particular the group of people who are oligarchs like Kolibayev and uh, Karim Masimov and others. I think this radical grouping group with uh, Turkish inclination could very much want to replace Takayev. And even though these authorities could uh, 
would keep to the Nazarbayev's image, they would not be make Russia or Kremlin happy. The Islamic resource of the Central Asian region would be affected and it will agitate everyone in the region. But the problem here is that many said that we don't know what the, the struggle was. We never mentioned here the clans and in Kazakhstan, there are a lot of them and we don't really understand them very well. This would, they would play the role. I'm not sure that everyone in Kremlin understands for a well what is happening there. And uh, I think they don't really know what's happening in Kazakhstan. Thank you. Again, we're thinking what we did not mention today, haven't mentioned today. Belarusian participants know that we have good experts in Kazakhstan who uh, describe very well what is happening in Kazakhstan. Fortunately, she's not uh, with us here. But let's follow the order that we plan to. We have Ekaterina here, who would also like to ask a question. Her question was about, uh, she says it's important that you notice that there was a violation of the international um, treaty, but there are mecha other mechanisms to discuss them at the international arena or are there any sanctions? Could such violations be prevented in the future? Agnieszka from Polskie Radio. Thank you very much, Agnieszka, because uh, Ekaterina said that the uh, formal violation is obvious, but what would be the consequences? It's hard to and understand why they shouldn't, they shouldn't be violated if there are no repercussions. And there are two points uh, here. Last one about uh, uh, connected to what you said, but I'll answer the question first. If we uh, start with the CSTO treaty, uh, the resolution, the mechanism there says that when the statute is violated, they first need to try to find a solution to the conflict among themselves, and then it's the council who's responsible for it. We understand this is an organization that consists of the limited number of members. Without a doubt, they're all in the orbit of Russia. They're controlled by Russia. Not the juror, but uh, the factor inside the organization, nobody will raise this, particularly since it's all about the limited format. It's very much about uh, if somebody is not happy, they should keep quiet. You know, we're not. As if we go up, I would like to remind you that. Uh, while all the states are members of the system, they are members of the United Nations, they have had assumed some responsibilities, they're signees to the UN Treaty, and uh, they're not free from responsibilities in this respect either. I would also uh, like to understand how Security Council would react and why it didn't react it, but there are a lot of elements here. Uh, a lot would depend uh, how will these truces, these forces will withdraw, and if they will withdraw. The question uh, whether they will leave at, at all, all of them. Some 
scientists, they have um, done anything bad yet. There have not been much of a problem for the Security Council, but uh, we need to follow this situation. It should have been discussed at the Security Council meeting, and I wouldn't want to state once again that there was a clear mechanism for that. If we talk about uh, what Vadim said, going back to what I said at the beginning of my presentation, this is the logic of the uh, state that I'm, I'm not used to reporting to anyone. Uh, um, there are lots of decisions made by uh, the countries, the audience. But we understand what's good and bad, and we need to aim for that. Even though some states are trying to look for the legal norms, None of them are saying that, you know, they aim in for uh, dictatorship. So when state need to act according to the rules, but they don't want to face consequences, this contradiction is solved. Um, As history shows it, it doesn't play in the hands um, and lots of victims may appear. Okay, we have several more raised hands. Maria Avdeeva from the European Ice Association wanted to ask something or say something. Thank you very much for the high level discussion. Uh, thank you for getting together good experts. I wanted to react to what Yekaterina said. Uh, you mentioned that system was used because they uh, wanted to use it. I wanted to highlight the fact that uh, we are now witnessing the talks uh, on uh, the NATO and the future of Ukraine, so in one of CSTO. I'm uh, monitoring the Russian fake news and uh, all the Russian news are saying that looking how fast we can deploy our forces where we need to, we can do it with, uh, within 24 hours. I, uh, if somebody sees connections here, or why did they do this? Several questions to Vitaly as uh, Lukashenko. Lukashenko at some point in the past did not uh, ask for sister forces to be involved, uh, knowing that it would jeopardize his position. Do you think now he will be at some point ready forced uh, to have a similar thing in Belarus to show NATO who's uh, in charge here. The second question to Yuri. There was information that uh, Russia was very quick to come and leave from Kazakhstan because Ra China expressed this position about this stance in this. Uh, 
I know that you uh, understand the topic of China very well. Do you think China uh, had particular influence on this? The fact that sister forces are rapidly leaving the country. Indeed, these questions are very relevant because uh, in the past we said that we uh, mentioned China in passing and uh, and there's, it's very important in this respect. I wanted also to add as an expert on disinformation. Uh, today we had, uh, there were two uh, reports of the Russian military correspondents uh, slash Russians uh, promoting the military doctrine which in Kazakhstan that showed that there are some American bio labs. Before that, they found similar labs in Georgia or Ukraine. Everywhere the Russia sent their forces. It's probably the labs there where they grow uh, coronavirus. Jokes aside, uh, let's answer the question. Thank you, Maria, for your interesting questions. I think that if we remember what happened in August 2020 when Lukashenko said that the, there are some reserves ready, If uh, there are fires and mass disorder or some buildings are blown up, uh, there were some military sources of pressure ready to help Belarusian authorities. Um, that was, they said at the time, it was enough of this uh, psychological political gesture coming from the Kremlin for uh, the Lukashenko vertical to support Lukashenko, even though they were hesitant at first. I think this is not only an opinion, this is a fact that if uh, the protest continued in Belarus in a more harsh way, the Russians will introduce and involve the uh, military units, send the, uh, I think Lukashenko will ask for that is my answer. Thank you. And uh, could you also say a few words about the Chinese factor? We did mention Turkey and China in passing, but what is their role there? There's enough uh, media outlets do not really talk much about that. I think the influence of China and the possibility to use it as the counterbalance to Russia. It's very interesting here because very often we see in many countries the factor of China is overestimated. We see the official position of China is quite uh, uh, non-violent and quite vague. They, you know, want peace in the world. Uh, it's uh, clear that we don't know what the Chinese authorities really think. There, but there are no active steps in this direction. Uh, China in uh, global times and written in English blames uh, the West for uh, the color revolution and attempts to influence uh, China and Russia. Nothing new here. Uh, this is the rhetoric is quite regular. But I believe for the next decades, uh, China will be concentrating their efforts on being rival for the United States. For, for China, it's important to have 
uh, Russia wants to be an ally for China in this situation. And they want to join their efforts. So the countries that Russia believes are part of the Uh, China is not interfering in this zone and they will not cross the red lines. I believe that the influence of China on Kazakhstan in post-Soviet space in, in Kazakhstan is overestimated. We see it in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh as well, uh, even though Nagorno-Karabakh is a part of the one Belt One Road particularly in the Caucasus, and the same is true in Ukraine. I think the uh, hypothesis that China could be a counterbalance for the Russian influence is uh, uh, is not particularly uh, valid. Uh, I think it, we need to reconsider it. Pavlik Bukowski wanted to raise your hand. I want to know that uh, very little change for the Lukashenko Belarusian uh, situation. Very little change for for them after Kazakhstan. If we consider the preparation for referendum, the latest date when the decree may appear on the 17th of January, we're still not uh, there. But in the document, there is a reference to the non-developed. Uh, description of the new border, all Belarusian assembly. This is an important element for reforming the political system of Belarus. If there is a bug like that, this is probably possibly a feature uh, which could influence the postponement of referendum. And it's enough to wait until 2025, the presidential election. Eventually, it could be connected to the electoral campaign to see how the situation, what the situation will be. An absence of this mechanism of forming the People's Assembly is not the coincidence, because Lukashenko mentioned that several times in 2021. And this is a possibility for postponement and uh, well, very well thought out. Hence, I believe that there could be references to the Kazakhstan. Again, Davidsky mentioned that in the interview to on NTV. He said that Uh, they should be cautious after seeing what's happened in Kazakhstan. But the referendum will not be postponed. It will happen at the end of February. Probably it will be implemented in a period of time. Russia will not probably be happy, but we have existed in the conditions when Russia and uh, Belarus have been hiding their uh, unhappiness about each other. Uh, just like in a uh, marital relations, there's a balance of powers and we're talking about the all people's assembly it's not clear uh, how many members of this assembly will be appointed 
were elected. Uh, but I believe it's not a bug of feature, but they spoke a lot about uh, they decided to put this off indefinitely, uh, the decision in this uh, field. Arseniy wanted to add something. I wanted to continue what Vitaly said, e echo uh, what Vitaly said. Uh, he described very well the situation in Belarus and uh, even at the psychological level, the threat of um, Russia sending the forces to Belarus scared the Belarusian elites. I think we can draw a parallel here with the situation in um, Kazakhstan. The question um, addressed to Arkady by Artyom shows it as well. I think uh, Moscow introduced the military into Kazakhstan to show uh, who they're supporting in this conflict. Elites of Kazakhstan uh, ended up in uh, unclear situation. In uh, Russia and Kremlin, they uh, were success in doing this. They mobilized the various structures here. Uh, talking about the parallels, on the 5th of February, A group of uh, councillors uh, from various um, special services, ministry, and administrations came to Kazakhstan to cons consult and hold consultations with uh, Takayev. I would like to remind you the similar plane, a group of people uh, came to Minsk in uh, during the protests in August 2020. We also know that uh, Kremlin has certain demands to Lukashenko. It's uh, interesting to know what kind of demands it has in Kazakhstan and uh, for the help it provided. And most importantly, the question is how uh, it will be implemented and the uh, promises fulfilled. Uh, the anti-crisis team of managers, they know what to tell to dictators to calm them down because they have already uh, experience of doing this. Or is also say Arkady wanted to say something. I think uh, we'll uh, stop on him because we are out of time. I can not see Arkady. Arkady is here. Anyway, it's important what I'm saying and how I look. I'll go back to the Chinese trace. I don't agree with the statement that China uh, is not involved. I have a suspicion that the statement of Takayev uh, with the proposal to um, finish the system mission. I don't know anything for sure, but uh, I don't have any proof of it, but uh, Takayev considered, to put it mildly, the mood of 
Beijing in this matter. And Beijing is not particularly happy about the loan presence of uh, Russian forces in Kazakhstan. Also, uh, it has to do with the uh, things we don't know much about. China is one of the guarantors of the sovereign te territorial integrity of Kazakhstan. This guarantee was provided to Kazakhstan as a uh, uh, guarantee uh, in a similar way as Budapest, Budapest Memorandum for Ukraine that Russia violated. Uh, it's going to with the withdrawal of the nuclear forces. So China was uh, one of the grantors there. So the wishes of China that would not be happy about long-term presence of Russian forces in Kazakhstan were considered by Takayev. Also a statement about uh, my remark about what Maria said. I don't watch Russian TV, but uh, uh, I think uh, I totally agree with what she said that the Russian media already has guidelines about what to do, what to say. Russia shows that uh, the ability to deploy the forces quickly and reap the benefits from it. It was uh, uh, easy to uh, predict. Everybody received their bonuses except uh, Nusultan Nazarbayev. Thank you very much, Arkady. It's a great point when we can end. Right, we'll see whether Mr. Nazarbayev will reappear. Uh, and here we'd like to thank all the participants for our discussion. I think um, I uh, know much better what is happening in Kazakhstan than I did two hours ago even though I've been uh, um, reading about this for extensively, I would like to remind you that the discussion of the Expert Analytical Club will continue this season, this year. Uh, we'll discuss the amendments to the constitutional draft and other hot topics. We also uh, mentioned the old topics like the influence of pandemic, so please stay tuned and uh, follow our uh, letters and announcement of the future discussion. Please subscribe to our channel and that of the U of, in YouTube. I would like to thank you all once again. I hope that this year will be not only interesting like it's beginning, but uh, as Arkady said, we all have our benefits reap our benefits and uh, thanks once again have a nice evening see you